such excitement at the topic. It's fantastic. Thank you very much for, for coming out on, uh, on a fairly balmy Canberra evening uh, to hear uh, Ian Bond tonight. Uh, before we get started, I think we need to uh, observe the uh, customary preliminaries. Uh, and I'd uh, certainly like to say that I acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians uh, on whose traditional lands we're meeting today. Uh, and to pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for coming out to a topic on Russia. Those of you who don't know me, uh, I, my name is Matt Sussex, uh, and I am the new academic director uh, at the National Security College. And this is a topic very much after my own heart. Uh, we've been running quite a few events recently uh, on Russia, and uh, I am going to be extremely selfish and continue to do more of them. But I think you are proof positive in coming out in such numbers tonight uh, that, uh, that topics such as this uh, are very, very important and resonate uh, with the public as well as the academic and the policy community. Also along for the ride tonight from the uh, NSC, we're privileged to have Martin Blaschik, uh, our media and communications person, uh, and Chris Farnham, where's Chris? Uh, he was on the door, uh, but uh, they will be assisting me uh, after Ian uh, finishes his, uh, his remarks, uh, identifying questions and handing uh, microphones around. For those of you who are new to the National Security College, uh, let me give you a very brief pricey about what we do. Uh, our purpose is to enhance primarily strategic understanding and critical thinking about Australia's uh, national security. But I think it's fair to say that our vision is broader than that. Uh, we uh, aim, aspire, if you like, to uh, act as a leader uh, in security teaching, uh, in security research, and particularly also in security policy engagement. Uh, and uh, we're very ably assisted tonight uh, in that aspiration. In fact, our work is virtually done in the form of Ian Bond, uh, who will be talking to us tonight uh, on the topic Troublemaker or Peacemaker, Russia's role in the Middle East and Asia. Uh, Ian, of course, is uh, very well known in his capacity as Director of Foreign Policy at the Centre for European Reform. Uh, and he's been there since 2013. And before that, he had a very long uh, and auspicious career as a diplomat for 28 years. And his main focus was on Russia uh, and the former Soviet Union. He's been posted in Moscow, in Riga, and in Washington. Uh, and at the UK delegations to NATO in Brussels uh, and the OSCE in Europe, uh, sorry, at the OSCE in Vienna. Uh, his publications for CER include The EU and Russia, Uncommon Spaces, and Frozen, The Politics and Economics of Sanctions Against Russia. Uh, and we'll ask Ian today to speak for around about 20, 25 minutes or so uh, to get him to sing for his supper assuming we're paying for it. Uh, and, uh, and then we will have good time for questions, probably about 20 minutes or so. So with no further ado, let me invite Ian to the microphone. Well, Matt, thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction. Uh, I have to say uh, that, I, that this must be the first talk that I have ever given where they've had to bring in extra chairs. So uh, thank you very much to all of you for coming out this evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Canberra, to be here at ANU, uh, and to be facing uh, such a good audience tonight. And I am also would like to say thank you very much to the British High Commission, who brought me halfway around the world uh, to talk to you here. Uh, I will admit that I was quite surprised when I heard how popular this, uh, this talk was, was uh, going to be uh, and how many people had signed up for it. Uh, Australia is a long way from Russia. You have quite a lot of issues in your own neighborhood and I would have forgiven you for thinking that Russia was really somebody else's problem. What I hope I can do this evening is to send you away thinking that uh, it's, it's a bit broader than that and that in some ways it poses some challenges to all of the democratic countries. I'll start by talking a bit about how uh, I think Putin sees the end of the, the Soviet Union and how we got to where we are now, how that set the stage for the confrontations of today. 
I'll talk somewhat about Russia's current foreign and defense policy and the new Russian national security strategy, which has just been published. Notwithstanding the title of my talk, I will say something about the Russian rela relationship with Europe because uh, that has a big impact on my country and other countries in my region, uh, but also because I think it, it affects some of what Russia is doing in other parts of the world. And I'll dig down a bit into the questions of Russia's relationship and its involvement in the Middle East, where, of course, both British and Australian forces are fi fighting Daesh. And I'll have a look at what, uh, what Russia is up to in Asia and whether Russia's announced pivot to Asia uh, is really as significant as the Russians would like us to believe. And then finally, if there's time, which I hope there will be, I'll try and draw a few conclusions about, uh, about Western policy. So how did we get into the mess that we are in, if I can put it that way? I mean, Putin has his version of the collapse of the Soviet Union, which he termed the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And his version is of a great country, a, a world benefactor, which saved mankind from Nazism which was then betrayed by weak and incompetent leaders who failed to prevent it being dismantled by a Western-inspired plot, uh, and that it was then betrayed again by the West, which took away its allies, uh, enlarged NATO at the expense of Russia, stole Russia's natural resources, and wasn't satisfied until it had organized an anti-Russian coup in Ukraine, which was a historic part of, uh, of Russian territory. Now, that's a slight caricature of, of Putin's position, but that is pretty closely based on public statements that he has made. He certainly regards the collapse of the Soviet Union as, in general, a bad thing. He's made no secret of his view that NATO enlargement was all about putting Russia in its box. He has cited uh, ancient history or even mythology to explain the unity of the Russian and Ukrainian peoples. And he makes an unfortunate habit, which actually has got worse in recent times, of stressing Stalin's good points <laughs> rather than, <coughs> than mourning the victims of Stalinism. Now, uh, you know, my perspective on the fall of the Soviet Union is rather different. First of all, I think it was a very brutal system. And secondly, in terms of what it actually delivered, it certainly delivered a, a rapid pace of modernization in the early stages when Russia was starting from a very low base. But it was a system which had built into it massive inefficiencies, which were almost bound sooner or later to lead to trouble. And the irony is, Putin thinks that the, the breakup of the Soviet Union was something which was engineered by the West. It was something which absolutely horrified leaders like George H.W. Bush and uh, John Major in the UK. They were much more worried about instability in a country which possessed the world's largest nuclear arsenal than they were about the self-determination of Georgians or Ukrainians. Now, I think in one way, Putin does understand the problems that were built into the Soviet economic system. Uh, in some remarks recently, he said, the inability to embrace change, to embrace technical revolutions and new technology led to the collapse of that economy. But he also has embedded in him this idea that this was a sort of gangland hit that was perpetrated by the West. And that infects his view of what the West is up to. There is a, a permanent suspicion of Western motivations. Now you see that carried over into the new national security strategy, which he uh, signed off on the 31st of December last year. This has become a bit of a tradition, and I wish that actually the, the Russians would stop this, but somewhere around Christmas or New Year, uh, over the last few years, you've got a foreign policy concept a military doctrine and now a new national security doctrine. Uh, and, you know, I, I have my nice pile of uh, Christmas books that people have given me to read. 
and then into my inbox will come 40 pages of dense bureaucratic Russian. It is not exactly a page turner. Uh, I, I have read it so you don't have to. I mean, various things strike me about it. The first is it's a very broad definition of national, of national security. Uh, it includes areas like culture uh, and education, which I don't think most Western governments would regard as national security issues as such. But it does give you an idea of where Putin and those around him think that threats to Russian interests are coming from. You know, they are obsessed with the idea that the West is trying to undermine traditional Russian values. The latest version of the national security strategy is much darker in tone than its predecessor, which was published in 2009. Uh, you know, that, ha that contained phrases about how Ro Russia had overcome the, uh, uh, the, the uh, crisis of the last decade of the 20th century. There's a real sense in the 2009 national security strategy that Russia thinks it's on a sort of upward trajectory. And that's despite the fact that at that point, actually, the Russian economy was going into a deep recession. But that sense of, of optimism and being on an upward course, that's missing from the new iteration. Uh, in fact, the, the UK-based Australian analyst and former Australian uh, diplomat, Bobo Lowe, said recently that he thought that this was the most anti-Western anti-American and anti-NATO official document that the Russian government had produced in the last 25 years. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's very gloomy, uh, besieged feel to this document. I mean, that leads me to an observation about this, uh, this thing, which is that um, if someone had given me a dollar for every reference in it to traditional Russian moral and spiritual values, I could buy a drink for most of you, I reckon. <laughs> um, there is, it's not simply that there is a military confrontation between Russia and the West. It's not simply that NATO is, at least in Russia's view, moving infrastructure into uh, areas on, on Russia's borders. I have to say, looking at what NATO is actually doing, it's pretty hard to see this stuff, but that's the way that it's viewed from the, the Russian side of the border. Uh, but it's that external values are being pushed onto uh, malleable young Russian minds. And that's why I think these sections on education and on culture appear in the national security strategy, because there is a sense that Russia has to defend against this that you have to have more patriotic education. You have to have the right kind of history to prevent people being infected by these, uh, these ideas. And one of the changes from the 2009 national security strategy is that back then, one of the cultural tasks was described as um, sharing, uh, enabling the Russian people to share the best of Western culture. That's gone. Western culture is now not regarded as something that you want the Russian people to, to share. I could buy you a second round of drinks if I had a dollar for every appearance of the, the term stability. And what worries me, we're all in favor of stability. But it, it's clear, not just from this document, from the, but from the way that Putin uses this term in general, that he is obsessed with stability, not in the sense of the absence of chaos, but in the sense of the absence of change. There, there is a, a, a great novel um, by an Italian, Lampedusa, called The Leopard. And the, the old nobleman in there, you know, the kind of great revelation that he has is that for things to say, stay the same, everything has to change. That is absolutely a lesson which Putin has not learned. Now, the national security strategy is not a strategy in the military sense of something which, which links together means and ends. Uh, it, it is um, designed to influence as well as to inform and to guide. 
And particularly when you get to the foreign policy section, uh, it, it's actually quite strong on Russia's desire for good relations with almost everyone, even with NATO. If NATO would, was prepared to have a relationship on Russia's terms to recognize a Russian sphere of influence, in effect, then Russia would be perfectly happy to, to cooperate. But you have to look at um, not just what's in the national security strategy, but at what the, the kind of people who had the last word on what went into it are themselves saying about their relations with the outside world. And if you look at Putin, and if you look at his, uh, the secretary of the Russian uh, Security Council, Nikolai Patrashev, who used to be the head of the, uh, uh, the Federal Security Bureau, the, uh, the internal security service of, uh, of Russia. Um, they have a very conspiratorial view of the world. They believe that bad things happen because bad people make them happen. And they certainly do not believe in the concept of spontaneous revolutions. Revolutions are inspired by somebody. Uh, if there is a revolution in Ukraine, it's because the Americans wanted there to be a revolution in Ukraine. And that's where I'm going to turn to the Middle East, because um, that, that sense carries through into Russian policy in the Middle East. If there is instability in the Mid Middle East, and if the West has supported change in the Middle East, then that must mean that the chaos that is now gripping the region is a result of a deliberate uh, Western policy of creating chaos in the region. Now, I'm not going to claim that Western policy in the Middle East has been a great success. In many res respects, if you look at Iraq, if you look at Libya, it's been pretty catastrophic. Uh, but that does not mean that because it's catastrophic, we wanted it to be a catastrophe. When I look at Russia's uh, renewed engagement in the, in the Middle East, it seems to me that there are sort of three, probably three things that uh, they are seeking to achieve. One of those is to show that unlike the West, which undermines not only its enemies but its allies in the region, Russia looks after its own. So the Americans on this narrative threw President Mubarak of Egypt under a bus, allowed him to be toppled, or even engineered his fall. Russia is not going to do that with President Assad. I am strongly of the opinion that one of the goals of the, of the Russians in going into Syria is to ensure that Assad stays in power. I do not buy the idea that they would even swap him for another acceptable leader from the Alawite minority from the same group as, uh, as Assad. Because why would they? Thanks to their airstrikes, the Syrian armed forces are now making gains. Uh, Assad is moving forward. And if the, uh, the, the Syrian leading elite didn't overthrow Assad during almost five years of rather disastrous conflict, why would it be sensible for Russia to try to displace him now when actually he's making some progress? So that's, that seems to me to be the first thing that's going on. The second thing which is linked to that is about presenting the West with um, an, uh, an uncomfortable, if not an impossible choice, which is, I call it the Chechen gambit because it reminds me of what happened in Chechnya. The Chechen conflict started with um, secular nationalists leading the Chechen uh, opposition to Russia. And I think if it had stayed that way, then probably by now Chechnya would have been independent. Most of the world would have recognized Chechnya as independent. The Russians, and I think Putin in his FSB days, before he became prime minister and then president, probably had something to do, that, do with this, killed off the moderate secular nationalist leader. And the figurehead of the Chechen revolution became a guy called Shamil Basayev. Uh, 
a mad Islamic radical who just happened to have worked for Russian intelligence before he became a Chechen separatist. And Putin was then able to say to the West, OK, we are doing some things in Chechnya which you don't like. You know, we are basically flattening the capital uh, with military action. People are disappearing. Yeah, this is, you know, we know you don't like this stuff. But the alternative to us is Shamil Basaya, a man who beheads Western hostages. Which would you like? And inevitably, Western protests about what was happening in Chechnya subsided and disappeared. Does that sound familiar? The British Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, said last week that about 70% of Russian airstrikes in Syria are hitting people who uh, the UK believes should have a part in Syria's post-Assad future. Those people are being cleared off the battlefield so that at some point there is a choice for the West. Do you go with Assad, who is up to his neck in blood, but who is not going to threaten your you know, terrorist attacks on your streets or our streets? Or do you go with Daesh, which has killed far fewer people in Syria than Assad has, but which is much more of a threat to the West? And I think the third element in uh, what, what the Russians are up to in the Middle East is securing a place at the top table. And in that, they have succeeded. Uh, I, I have my doubts that Putin has a solution to the uh, Syrian problem. But he can certainly block the West from some of the things that we might at some point have decided to do. I mean, for example, the Turks have for some time wanted to have uh, to create safe areas in uh, in Syria. With the uh, the presence of Russian air defense assets in Syria, creating no fly zo no fly zones uh, to be able to have relatively safe areas from airstrikes and so on, is off the table. It's just impossible. Now I think there's a flaw in Putin's thinking about Syria which is that this is not just a conflict between the people who are on the ground fighting there, but it's also a proxy conflict which involves Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and others for that matter, but certainly those primarily. And I think at least some of those countries are prepared to keep fighting to the last Syrian. I, I don't see at the moment a scenario in which Putin is able to impose uh, a solution in which everybody else basically gives up and says, OK, we have fought for nothing for the last five years. We accept that Assad is going to be in charge, maybe with some token opposition figures attached to a government of national unity, but fundamentally, nothing really will have changed. I simply don't think that those external players who themselves have invested so much at least treasure in the conflict, uh, are, are going to give up the struggle straight away. And I think that there is a side benefit from Putin in Russia's engagement in the Syrian conflict, which is that it's putting enormous stresses on European unity because of the refugee crisis. I can't prove that Russia is deliberately exacerbating the refugee crisis. But I, I am pretty certain that it is deliberately exploiting it within Europe. If you look at uh, the levels of Russian support for anti-immigrant populist parties in a number of European countries, and if you look at the propaganda that we see from RT and from Sputnik, they are working on uh, heightening tensions on playing up the, the differences between European countries on how to handle migration. I think that's a real problem for us. So that's the troublemaker side. Now, I don't want to say that this is a, a one color picture because you can look at another aspect of Russian behavior in the Middle East. And in relation to the Iran nuclear talks, the Russians have actually played a, a very constructive role. Even when the West had sanctioned Russia over its intervention in Ukraine. 
the Russians continued to play a constructive role in the Iran talks. I think there are a number of reasons for that. But the greatest one is self-interest. The Russians had no interest in having another nuclear power on their borders. Even if relations are currently quite friendly between Tehran and Moscow, you can't guarantee that that will always be the case. And if the Russians had gained, uh, sorry, if the Iranians had gained a nuclear weapon, you would not know what eventually, what use that might be put to. And not only that, but what you could be relatively certain of was that it would lead to greater uh, American and Israeli military engagement in the region and quite, quite likely to a, a conflict between Iran and those countries, uh, which would certainly not be good for Russia sitting not so very far away from Iran across the Caspian Sea. So I think there was a strong Russian self-interest in helping to manage this process of uh, getting the Iranians out of the nuclear weapons business. And secondly, I think, it, again, there was a top table issue there, that it gave the Russians a chance to, uh, to enhance their international prestige and to show that there were certain issues that could only really be solved if you had the Russians at the table. What I'm not sure about with Russia in the Middle East is whether it actually has a long-term strategy. And why I say that is its, its economic interests are actually not well served by the current state of its relations with Iran and Saudi Arabia. I mean, the irony of the nuclear deal is that it will bring back onto the market a lot of Iranian oil which will further drive down the price of Russia's main export. And the bad relationship with the Saudis is certainly not going to encourage them to play their traditional role uh, as the sort of swing producers who will cut their production in order to raise the price. So, you know, there are some interesting dynamics there and we have yet to see how they will play out now that there is a, a nuclear deal. Um, but it's not clear to me that, um, that the Russians have quite thought out the tactics of where this leads them. Now, uh, turning to, to Asia, uh, and Russia, of course, as with the Americans, claims that it is turning to Asia. Now, I'm looking forward to discussing an excellent paper that Matt has written on Russia's rebalance to Asia. Uh, and any of you who care to come to Sydney on Friday afternoon will be able to join us in discussing that. I mean, there's a, a sort of eternal question for Russia, which is, is Russia a, a European or a nation power? And of course, geographically, most of it is in, in Asia. Um, but demographically, most of it is in Europe. And I think notwithstanding the fact that um, Putin has moved away from rhetoric which he used to use about how Russia was a great European power, I, I think that most of the Russian population still regards itself as not Asian at any rate. Whether they regard themselves as European is another question, or whether they regard themselves as something a bit special. Um, but uh, you know, there's a slight discomfort in this this pivot to Asia, in, you know, are they pivoting as outsiders or as part of the Asian scene? Now, I agree with Matt's paper, uh, what Matt said in his paper, that a rebalance to Asia is necessary if Russia wants to uh, secure a place in the Asian century. The question for me is whether it's actually possible for Russia to do that. Uh, Russia's physical presence in, in Asia is not what you might anticipate. You know, the, the, the infrastructure links between the European part of Russia and places like Vladivostok have barely improved since the 19th century. Uh, and it's not clear to me that the Russians either have the resources or are, or are prepared to invest the resources that would be necessary to uh, reorient their, their um, economic links 
and to strengthen the ties across the, the country in the way that they would have to. The other thing that concerns me about where Russia is heading in Asia is, again, whether they have a strategic view. I mean, they are trying to build a stronger relationship with China, and I absolutely understand the point of that. Everybody is trying to build a stronger relationship with China uh, because of its economic strength, because of its growing weight on the, on the international political scene. But at the same time, the Russians are trying to preserve their traditional good relations with China's regional rivals, India and Vietnam. Can they, can they keep all three of those relations as good as, they, uh, as the, the two relations with India and Vietnam have been? I don't know. Uh, you know. I don't know what the Chinese think about the fact that the Russians are selling them and the Vietnamese the same class of submarines when the Chinese and the Vietnamese are in a standoff in the South China Sea. I don't think it is a deliberate Russian policy to stoke a regional arms race. Uh, but in their pursuit of um, markets for their defense business, which actually is important in terms of their own defense modernization, in terms of providing the resources for it, I think they are taking some non-strategic decisions in the region, uh, which ought to be of concern in terms of an area which is already quite tense. If you look at the relationship with China, one of the motivations is clearly to, to be able to say to the Europeans in particular, we have alternative markets. You know, we, we sell you an enormous amount of gas, but you know, maybe tomorrow we'd rather sell it to the Chinese. Now this is not a real threat in a way because the infrastructure isn't there for doing that. Um, but you know, there, is, there is no question that the Chinese have an interest in acquiring uh, gas and energy resources from wherever they can get them. Uh, and that if the Russians are prepared to offer it at the right price, the Chinese will buy it. But there are also areas in which it's not so clear that China and Russia have uh, coinciding interests. And Central Asia is one of those. Uh, Xi Jinping went to Moscow in May last year for the 70th anniversary celebrations of the end of the Second World War. And he and Putin agreed that China's Silk Road economic belt and uh, Russia's, or the Russian-led, Eurasian Economic Union should be harmonized. I was in Moscow uh, three or four weeks after that and asking people, well, what does that mean? And nobody could really tell me. But what it seems to me is that, that Russia is in a situation where it's trying to preserve its influence in Central Asia. And really what we're talking about here is, is the, the parts of the Silk Road um, program which, are, which engage Central Asia. And Russia is trying to keep its, uh, its influence in those areas at, at a time when objectively its relative strength there is declining and China's is, is increasing. The Chinese are handling this in a very subtle way. What they're doing so far is that, that they recognize that for Russia, um, the, the provision of security in that region is what buys Russia influence. And the Chinese are sort of occupying the economic space and allowing the Russians to continue to, uh, to provide security. But I don't know how viable that model is in the long term. I mean, essentially, the Chinese are reaping all the economic benefits, and the Russians are providing the security force. At some point, I guess the Russians will start to ask themselves whether they really want to be doing that if they're not getting any profit out of it. Looking at other parts of Asia and the parts that perhaps are more you know, closer to you in some ways, um, I mean, there's a certain amount of Russian muscle flexing going on. Uh, so a week or so ago, they sent two strategic nuclear bombers to fly around Japan, which is something that they have been doing uh, on a, a, an increased tempo in Europe for quite a few, uh, 
you know, for a couple of years now, really since the, uh, the tension around Ukraine started. Uh, they're beefing up their Pacific fleet, modernizing their Pacific fleet, which I guess hasn't been modernized since the Soviet period, so it's probably long overdue. I don't know quite what they're up to. I mean, is this about the US? Are they, in a sense, saying to the US, well, you are pivoting to, to Asia, you are strengthening your military presence in this region, we, we have to do the same. Are they sending some sort of a message to the Japanese? You know, the Japanese are spending more on defense, uh, becoming more assertive in the, uh, in the defense and security field. Is Russia trying to say to the Japanese, don't overstep the line? You know, we, we've got your number. Uh, or are they subtly signaling to China that they are not prepared to be the, the junior partner in every area of the relationship? I don't know. And you can't get it out of the national security strategy. There isn't a very, a very clear statement of how Russia sees the security picture in this region. Some of it looks quite opportunistic, I would say. Now, the good side of that is I don't see that there is um, the same kind of direct confrontation between Russia's view of, of its interests in, uh, in Asia and the Pacific and Western goals in the region in quite the way that, that there is in Europe. I mean, over North Korea, the Russians have been a relatively passive, but also a relatively benign participant in the, uh, the six-party process, such, as, such as, is, as it is. And they've been content, for the most part, to tuck in behind China, uh, and certainly not to encourage nuclear proliferation on the Korean Peninsula. And I think there, the, you know, there are some of the same sorts of thoughts that guide their policy towards, uh, towards Iran. For me, if there is a, a risk in the Russia-China uh, love-in, if that's what it is, um, it's not so much actually what they will do together in this region, but it's more broadly the way in which they operate in international organizations uh, and the interests that they see in either undermining or at any rate changing the balance of the, the international liberal order. Uh, whether that's in relation to UN human rights mechanisms or governance of the internet, they have some interests in the international arena that are at variance with those of the Western democracies. I'm going to come to a conclusion you'll be glad to hear. I suppose I have to answer the question that was put in the title, which is, you know, peacemaker or troublemaker. And I suppose my answer would be yes. <laughs> uh, but we're in a more complicated situation with Russia than we were in the Cold, in the Cold War, where in a sense you, you expected confrontation across the board and you got it. And so we need a more um, subtle set of responses, in a way. Our interest is in a, a rules-based system. And so I think the fundamental uh, principle on which we have to operate in dealing with Russia is that that is what we need to protect. Now, the Russians, I think, prefer a system of great power bargaining. It's always interesting for me to look at the the importance that Russia attaches to the UN Security Council uh, and the way that when um, Russia was putting forward proposals for changing Euro Europe's security architecture, they wanted a European Security Council. You know, they like systems in which the big powers make decisions and the small powers accept the de decisions that are made for them. And I don't think that's a route that, the, that we should follow them down. The second thing that I would say is we need to compartmentalize as well as the Russians do. They did not throw their toys out of the pram in the Iran talks when the West sanctioned them over Ukraine. They took a very cold look at what were their interests in the Iran talks and what were their interests in Ukraine, and they pursued the two independently. And what I'm seeing a little bit in, in Europe in relation to Syria is that some countries are saying, well, you know, 
we need the Russians to help us on Syria, so we must do some sort of deal with them on Ukraine. I'm sure the Russians would be delighted if we did that, but I don't think that they would be surprised or disappointed if we didn't. So we need to be as good as they are at keeping separate things separate. Finally, I think we need to be patient. I, I'm assuming that Putin is going to be in power until 2024, at least. Well, that is when his next... I mean, I assume he will stand for re-election in 2018, and it's a six-year term. So assuming that he stays healthy, and he's obviously a man who looks after himself, <laughs> uh, you know... I wish I had his abs. <laughs> um, but he's going to be there for a while. So we, we can't just sort of hope that he's going to go off the scene. He hasn't really built a succession uh, mechanism. And that ought to be a bit of a worry. And one of the ways in which I think the Chinese have been smarter than the Russians uh, is that the Chinese have actually developed a system uh, whereby you have some predictability about who comes next. And also some sort of guarantee that as you leave power, you're not going to be uh, chucked in jail or worse. Putin doesn't have that confidence. You know, he, he put Medvedev in place, but he didn't have the confidence that Medvedev would protect what, what he, Putin, wanted to, uh, to build in the country. So it does, that does make me worry that if you look out beyond 2024, the system may be more brittle than we think it is. What that says to me is that we have to build for the long term. We actually have to keep talking to the Russians. Isolating the Russians is a mugs game. Whether it plays a positive role or a negative role, it will play a big role. And what we should be doing is laying the foundations for the long term uh, trying to identify the, you know, the people who have a future, uh, the people who have bright ideas. Uh, I think we, we have not done enough to cultivate Russia's younger generation, uh, to look for scholarship schemes and the like, uh, and to build a group of people who don't think that the West is always out to get, to get them. If, as I said, the national security strategy is intended to influence as well as to inform, one of its audiences is people in Russia, and it is intended to make them feel that they're living in a country which is under siege. Now, I am hope, perhaps hopelessly optimistic, but I hope that one day the Russians will break out of that psychological framework, that fear of the outside world, and realize that their lives could be so much better if they were better governed. That the West is richer and happier, not because it has cheated the Russians, but because the Russians' own leaders have cheated them. I don't know whether that's realistic. Maybe, as I say, that's just a utopian dream. But that would be my hope. And on that note, I'm going to end and uh, open the floor to questions. Thanks, Ian. Um, I, I must say that, that um, I don't think I've ever heard anyone cover such a broad sweep on Russian uh, strategic security policy uh, so persuasively in such a short time. So well done. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you've got a lot of questions, so I won't uh, uh, fill up the airwaves. Uh, can I ask that uh, when uh, we go to you, that uh, you uh, just give your name and your affiliation if you'd like to and try and keep your questions as short as possible so that we can get through uh, as many as we can. Nikola? Hi, uh, my name is Nikola Pirovich. I'm a PhD student here at the National Security College. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I've got a few comments. I'll limit myself to one um, and I have a burning question. So I'll go with the comment first. It's a sort of a constructive criticism. Um, much of the talk focused on, on a, a lack of sort of grand strategy in Russia, whether it's the Middle East or, or the Asian pivot. And yet, um, I couldn't help but think, um, when you notice Russia's strategy of ex ex exacerbating the um, immigration crisis or migrant refugee crisis in um, Syria, that that kind of smacked of some sort of um, grand strategy. So yeah. I was just wondering, um, 
or to me it seemed like a bit of a contradiction and, and maybe in some ways um, echoing Putin's um, conspiratorial thinking towards the West. But I'll leave that as a comment. My burning question is, as, as a diplomat, um, if you could give us some thoughts on your, um, uh, on your take on the situation when the um, whole um, chemical weapons issue uh, exploded in a way and it was kind of obvious or it seemed obvious that the US was going to intervene and then the sort of Russian diplomatic outflanking movement to take that away and we didn't have an intervention, intervention in Syria. So that's something I'd be really interested in hearing about. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the grand strategy question, I, I, I want to underline, I don't think that the, the, uh, the Russians are deliberately uh, provoking the refugee crisis. You know, I mean, I don't think that the, the Russians are, as it were, standing on the Syrian border pushing people across. Uh, but what I do think uh, is that they have been uh, exploiting what is happening uh, in relation to Europe. Uh, and you know, whether you call it grand strategy or not, uh, I think for the current Russian administration, uh, weakening NATO and the EU uh, is quite an important way of um, relatively strengthening their position in, in Europe. And if you, you know, if the biggest thing that is putting strains on the European Union at the moment is the refugee crisis, then finding a smart way to use that um, is, is pretty good tactics. So whether, you know, I, I, it's not that I think that there is a kind of conspirator sitting there saying, well, if only we can get more refugees into Europe, it'll put even more strain on the system. But, you know, you, you, somebody said that, that um, Putin, Putin doesn't have a strategy, he has a methodology. Uh, it's about exploit, you know, it's about exploiting opportunities. Um, so that, that's how I, how I would see that. And I, I look at the, the CW uh, case in somewhat in the same way. And Putin actually, I think, uh, could see the extent of reluctance on the part of the Western powers to go down the military route. At the same time, he saw a chance to, to gain some credit. To, to, and which certainly succeeded. You know, the, the Russians were seen as having, in a sense, rescued us from a difficult position. And yet what happened? Assad was left to continue to kill people. Uh, you know, the, Assad's position was not really weakened, but Putin's position was strengthened. And the West moved no further forward towards its goal of trying to replace Assad. So it was a it was a nice strategy, uh, you know. It's the kind of thing that I think should go into diplomatic handbooks. Uh, hello, my name is Arman. Um, I'm an international student from Kazakhstan. It's a Central Asia region, so it's pretty oh. close to me. Uh, the same, so we are the so we have a big influence on Russia as well. So we as well we are the Muslim country. So I have this one short comment on you about the biggest uh, Western and NATO partner in the Middle East is about Saudi Arabia. So as you know that Saudi Arabia is ruled by the Wahhabi regime and uh, mostly that uh, all terrorist organizations in the world is supported by Saudi Arabia. So it's, it's a fact. So there is no human rights, there is no rights of uh, women. Uh, the, at least 70 persons were killed uh, during January who were the, against this regime. Uh, so uh, as this, I have some short story about our country as well. Saudi Arabia is the biggest uh, supporter of, uh, like, they have huge support from US and NATO in our country as well. Uh, a lot of mosques is uh, supported by the oil money of Saudi Arabia, and so on and so on. When our country and our government would like to protect themselves and they would try to close the ultra-terroristic mosques, uh, we always have a protest from the ambassador of US or something like this. So for our country, we have a choice. You go with Russia, with no terroristic organizations at all, with the status quo that you can learn, like girls can go to schools and so on and so on. Or the second choice, you go with the Western countries, with the NATO, uh, but you will receive the maybe new Taliban in this Central Asia region. Mm. So what is the command and uh, <laughs> how we could do, we'll deal with yeah. this. Uh, and for, for the one moment that Kazakhstan is the biggest producer of uranium in the world. So I think that Western countries who think about it, 
a little bit more like in this aspect as well. Thank you. Can you please comment this kind of things? Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I am not a British government spokesman, so I will speak as I think. Um, and what I think is that we really do have an enormous problem with Saudi Arabia. And I think you're absolutely right to point to the funding that Saudi Arabia provides for radical mosques and uh, Islamic schools in a number of parts of the world, not just, uh, not just in Central Asia, uh, but certainly in, in, um, in Pakistan and indeed in Western countries. Uh, so I do think we have a big problem. And uh, it is, it's become a dangerous relationship for us because actually we also rely on the Saudi Arabians uh, as partners in the fight against terrorism. Uh, you know, the irony is that while they are funding uh, some pretty unsavory groups, they are also providing intelligence on some pretty unsavory groups. So we find ourselves in a very uncomfortable position and I am not happy with the extent to which the UK uh, has become linked to Saudi Arabia in the region. I, I think you know, there are other partners that we should be looking to. At the same time, I absolutely wouldn't accept the, uh, the thesis that if Kazakhstan partners with NATO, that automatically means that NATO is going to you know, provide you with, uh, with Saudi Arabia as an as a added bonus. Um, <laughs> You know, the, there is no question uh, that Western countries do worry about the risks of the rise of Islamic fundamentalism in, uh, in Central Asia. Uh, you know, we all remember that among those who, uh, who fought against us in Afghanistan was the Islamic movement of uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, so, you know, we do recognize the problems. Uh, and, I mean, the other thing I would say is that Kazakhstan actually exemplifies a multi-vector foreign policy probably more successfully than almost any other state in the, in the region. Uh, you know, your president has done a, a remarkable job of balancing good relations with Russia, good relations with China, and good relations with the West. Kazakhstan's just signed an enhanced partnership and cooperation agreement with the EU. Uh, and I assume that you would not have done that if you thought that, uh, you know, that was, as it were, bringing in its train radical Islamic uh, mosques. So, you know, it seems to me that, that uh, of all the countries in that region, uh, Kazakhstan is probably the, the one that has followed the smartest policy in terms of not becoming too dependent on any of its potential partners, whether it's Russia or any of the others. Hi, my name is Roman Madaus. I'm a master's student at the Strategic and Defense Studies Center. I was hoping you could comment on the link between Russia's foreign policy adventures in Syria and Ukraine and to what extent you think that that is motivated by domestic concerns. There's definitely the perception that as Putin's regime feels that it's under pressure from sanctions, from poor economics, that it might want to lash out to create this internal siege mentality. So looking at the oil prices right now and seeing as the Russian econ economy is certainly not on stable footing, do you think that if, for instance, the Russian economy or the ruble really took a nosedive this year, that we would see more adventurism if you were to sort of turn up the heat on the conflicts in which he already has gone into? Hi, my name is Benjamin Baker. I work for The Diplomat magazine, uh, and I have two questions. I'll, I'll make them real short. Uh, the first one is, uh, to what extent do you believe that the Russian engagement in Syria is, you know, mostly, a, or at least partially a tactical one? You know, Russia has been, is in the middle of this big military modernization, and, you know, it's probably anxious to test out a lot of its military equipment and doctrine, uh, kind of like Nazi Germany did in Spain in the 1930s. The other question is, and it's something that I felt that I kind of missed a bit during your talk, was to what extent does, you know, the sense of Russian belonging, ethnicity, this has long been a you know, part of Russian uh, foreign policy and is probably a keystone of their Ukraine or one of the big reasons behind their Ukraine engagement. So what kind of future developments can we see in that field? Thank you. My name's Terry Henderson. When you opened, you talked about Putin's <coughs> attitude towards what had happened to Russia and how it had been betrayed and everything. With China, there's a very similar attitude about how it was let down by foreigners, one group of whom were the Russians who took a, 
play a lot of Chinese territory to, towards the north. Do you think uh, Chinese feelings about this are going to flavor China-Russia relations over the next few decades? Mm. Okay. Shall I take those, those three then? Okay. Yeah, the link between um, domestic pressures and foreign policy, policy adventures. I think that's, that's quite right. Um, the question for me is how long is that sustainable? Um, let me take a step back. I think one of the lessons that Putin draws from the late Soviet period is that as things started to go wrong economically, Gorbachev's response was to retreat, to pull in his horns. And I think Putin looks at that and thinks that the result of it was the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I think he will try and be assertive, even in the face of domestic weakness, but I think he also has to be hoping that um, the price of oil recovers. Because otherwise, the more assertive he is, the more problems he's actually storing up. So a lot for him turns on, uh, on what happens to the, to the oil price. But I do think that there is the risk of more uh, foreign adventures. And uh, it, you know, it's a really useful mobilizing tool. People do rally to the flag. Um, and uh, you see, you know, the, the, high, the high levels of support for Putin may not be 100% reliable, uh, but nor are they 100% lies. Uh, are the Russians using Syria as a testing ground for, for new <coughs> weapons? Uh, I mean, I, again, I think that comes probably into the category of fringe benefits. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's no question that uh, you know, there's, there's some signaling going on um, that the, the launch of the uh, cruise missiles from the Caspian to strike targets in Syria was intended to say not to the people who were on the receiving end, look at what we can do with cruise missiles, uh, but to say to NATO and others, look what we can do with cruise missiles. Um, you know, these, this was the first time these things had been fired in anger. Uh, and yeah, it was quite an impressive display. So I think that, you know, that is an important thing. We had an interesting dis discussion earlier this morning, actually, uh, with Matt and some of his colleagues about uh, the, the, the Russian ethnos um, and the way in which Putin has flirted with this idea of the Russians as the the largest divided people in the world. Uh, so you start to look at Russia as uh, an ethnic category rather than a national category. And that's a very dangerous thing in a country which is actually quite multi-ethnic. You know, there are a lot of people in, in the Russian Federation who are not ethnic Russians. Um, so I expect to keep hearing about so-called compatriots abroad but I wonder whether, uh, I mean, the, the, the point that was made this morning was that, um, the, that in 2014, at the time of the annexation of Crimea, Putin started talking about Ruskia, which is the ethnic Russians. But the um, national security strategy has gone back to talking about Rasiskia, which is Russians of what, whatever ethnicity who happen to live in the Russian Federation. Um, so there may actually be a slight step back there from the, the ethnic definition. And the question of the, the un, unjust treaties. There was a very interesting article written for the uh, Carnegie Center in Moscow, uh, probably about a year ago now by a Russian expert on China, claiming that the Chinese had raised exactly this question by renaming part of a border town, Aigun, which was the name of the place where the, uh, one of these unjust treaties by which China ceded an enormous amount of territory to, uh, to Russia had been signed. Um, but the, the, the Chinese have not made a great fuss about that. I think it comes into the category of useful leverage if you ever need it. You know, the, Russia, the Russians and the Chinese, uh, 
have actually got a, a border uh, agreement, you know, they have actually accepted that this is the border, this is where it is, this is where it stays. Um, but were, were relations ever for some reason to deteriorate seriously? I, I'm sure that the Chinese are not above just very gently touching the Russians and saying, this is something that we, you know, we, we have not forgotten. It's not, it's not today's problem. We're all good friends. We have a border. We've accepted the border. But, you know, we remember that this was once China. So I, I think it's, it's always going to be there at the back of the minds, but I don't think in any foreseeable future that the Chinese are going to pursue that. Um, thank you again for coming. Those of you who are also interested in our program of events uh, forthcoming, please do check us out, nsc.anu.edu.au, or get in touch with either Martin or Chris, and they'd be happy to, uh, to help you. But uh, thank you again uh, to Ian for these excellent presentations. Well, it was my enormous pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.